Well, welcome back to Otaku no Video. As always, thank you very much for joining me, where today I'm going to be digging deeper into the anime film Summer Wars by Mamoru Hosoda. Now, this is going to be a spoilerific video where I kind of dig deeper into the themes and elements of the movie. So if you're uh, looking to watch it unspoiled, turn this video off now. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the major themes of the film. And I think arguably, or almost inarguably, the, the major theme is family. Um, almost every scene in this film has something to do with revealing how a family should act, or shouldn't act, but mostly how a family should act. This is a remarkably functional family. It has its problems, but everyone looks out for each other, everyone protects each other, um, and everyone finds that to be a fundamentally important thing to do. And that theme of protection also is, um, uh, shows up in a lot of ways. You notice how many of the characters in their normal lives are firefighters, emergency response personnel, um, you know, one guy works in the train line. They all, they're all public servants in some way. They all help the community, or most of them, shall we say. So you know, that, that's the subtle hint that this is a family that's all about protecting, protecting people and, and, and protection. Um, and I think one of the, the great um, examples of that is the dog. Have you noticed how many times people in this film are, their attention is drawn to something by the dog and the dog barking at something? I think that's an important metaphor for this whole element of the importance of family, that this is a part of the family and it's a very minor element, not an important part in the plot at all except that when the dog gets upset, people notice that and people re react, Kenji in particular, but we'll get to that more in a second. Um, and then I, I think that's wonderfully um, summed up or, or at least um, reflected on most dramatically with Wabiske, who is an outsider that the family basically took in, kind of an outsider, and that the family has to deal with. They may not like him, but he's there and they have to deal with him. And whatever Wabiske does, even when he's doing kind of evil things, he's doing it for the family. It's, it's been, you know, worked into his bones. So, you know, uh, just how all that is, is brought together, I was very impressed by in terms of, of, of having this character that is both an antagonist and an exemplar for the themes of the film. And uh, I think that that's, you know, um, in fact, Wabiske's return and the first time he shows up in the film uh, is, a, is a, an amazing scene. I'm going to talk about some of the, the, the really remarkable scenes and shots in this film where, you know, Kenji walks into this, the dining area and his eyebrows go up and we cut to a shot of a bunch of the family members sitting and standing with their backs to us, looking out, no dialogue. You know, we can hear someone speaking, but just the stances and how people are standing and sitting tell us something's wrong. Very little animation, it's all visual impact. From a storytelling perspective, that's a pretty gutsy move of not telegraphing to your audience this important story element, but of making it kind of a mini mystery and then have that be revealed slowly by characters over time. We don't know why folks are ticked off with Wabiske for several minutes until there's that little kitchen gossip scene. And then, of course, the scene is, is further complicated when Natsuki shows up and she has the exact opposite reaction to everyone else in the family. And you realize, oh boy, this is, a, this is, a, this is gonna be rough. And then there's the, the, the scene of, of Kenji being woken up by the dog and the fact that he's asleep, he starts waking up and then his eyes snap open as he realizes this isn't just a dog barking in the distance. This is a family member who is saying, something's wrong, something's wrong, someone needs to do something, something's wrong, something's wrong. And he reacts, he gets up and he, you know, the, the dog runs off and he goes off to find out what's going on. Um, and that's how Kenji is being uh, brought into this family of realizing that even the dog is someone to, be, to, to, to pay attention to. When that dog's upset, people pay, pay attention. Uh, which of course leads to the scene of Granny's death. And I've shown Summer Wars to, to uh, four people now. And I've watched them during this scene and nobody expects Granny to die in this scene. 
They all come into it pretty light. And then Granny passes away. And what's also amazing about the sequence is that it's not played dramatically. It's very matter of fact. There's no swell of dramatic music. Um, things just sort of peter out as folks give up. And you realize it's over. She's dead. Which leads to, by my vote, the most impressive shot in the film, which is that long, slow pan across the family. Um, and it's funny, I was thinking about how Disney would have run that. And I'm not anti-Disney. I, I love Disney, and they're an amazingly impressive uh, company. But they're kind of exemplars for the Western way of doing things. And a Western animation perspective would be you show how characters are reacting to this through their movement by showing them, you know, sobbing gently or kicking a post or, um, you know, shifting uncomfortably or whatever. This shot has very little movement. There's that one terrible shot of the little girl, you know, sort of pounding on her mother's chest and leaning forward. But in general, and I think there's one other person moving, but in general it's, it's just silhouettes. And that static element um, not only reinforces the metaphor that nobody can do anything now, that they have to be passive, they can't be active, nothing to do, so they are still. It's kind of like a, a, an oil painting, for example, a great, great oil painting, where because it's still, you can really look at everything going on, and you can really pay attention to all the different elements and how they relate and correlate and so forth. Because that shot has so little movement, you get the full effect of it. And the fact that they're, they're, they're silhouettes. You know, they're basically just black outlines. Um, which is further gets across that image that this is not about individual families grieving. This is about the fa not, it's not about individuals grieving. This is about the family grieving. It's a whole group, and you're seeing them as a tableau which pans along to Kenji and Natsuki sitting side by side, but very separate. There's that gap between them. And neither of them have any idea what to do. Um, and I'll go back to that in a second. Um, and then, of course, the family starts to rally, and which then leads to my favorite line in the film, which is a funny line, but for me, it just it hits so many things. Partly because it's, it's been a pretty dramatic ride up to this point in the, in, in the film for the past quite a few minutes. And then we get this sort of relief with that line, should we all really be eating right now? Granny was pretty clear. Um, and, you know, you laugh. Because not only is it is a relief, it's true. That is what the family is doing, is no, no matter what's going on, we need to sit down and take this meal together and... It gets down to one of, the, one of these elements of humility, which is a common the theme in, in Asian cinema in general, and Asian storytelling in general, the idea of the importance of humility. Um, that we have these certain rituals and traditions that you don't question unless there's a really good reason to question them. You know, It's important to follow these, um, unless they become completely you know, pointless, but you know, just following them has a purpose. And eating together is one of those things that just needs to be done as a family. So let me talk a bit about, about, about the characters um, and Kenji and how he changes over the course of the film. He, Kenji has a pretty normal anime teen boy protagonist uh, progression over the course of the film. He starts very passive, ends up more active. But I appreciate the fact that he starts pretty darn passive. And by the end of the film, he is somewhat more active. You know, it's not an extreme jump. In fact, f for the first half of the film, really the only thing that motivates him is the fact that uh, his account was stolen. You know, and he's like, I, my Facebook account was stolen. I got to fix that. Because let's be honest, Oz is Facebook. So, um, you know, for a long time, he's basically passive until um, Granny passes away and, and, and he starts gaining a certain quiet, not self-assurance. Well, it is self-assurance. Um, he has this steadiness to him that, no, this needs to be done. And people can shout him down if they want to, but he, he, you know, he's pretty sure about this, and he will say it. Um, 
And of course, that's set up over the course of the films. So it's not a shock. The other character I want to talk about, and it's actually kind of remarkable to me how few characters I really want to talk about in this, but I do want to talk about Natsuki, who <laughs> Granny describes as a silly goose. She starts out with this harebrained scheme of bringing this boy in and lying about being engaged. Um, and then in the course of a day, her life kind of falls apart. You know, her beloved granny passes away, and her beloved uncle Wabiske appears to be responsible. You know, the two people she most look up to in life suddenly are, are kind of ripped away from her. And you can see as a result of that, she's pretty shattered. What I appreciate is that she doesn't become completely passive and unable to process anything. Um, I mean, anyone, you know, the day after somebody passes away is going to be grieving and is going to be unable to really process things fully. But we see she picked up Wabuske's iPhone. She's still thinking. Um, and I say that because it's so typical in an anime uh, work period that female characters are either strong female characters, you know, Claymore, you know, those sorts of characters, or they are completely passive. You know, there's very little in between. And Natsuki manages to be that in between, where she has flaws and, 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 and issues. But, you know, having that blow dealt to her doesn't make her a completely passive person for the rest of the film. So that's, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I, I want to point out how um, much in this film is revealed through visuals rather than dialogue. And I've already touched on this, this somewhat, but I, this, I want to highlight, for example, one scene where um, Kenji is walking around the house at night and the little toddler runs past him naked. Um, and by the way, let's just be honest, the toddler is Kari from Digimon. You know, it just is. You know, if you see Digimon in the first movie, when she's a toddler, it's her. Um, because, same director. <laughs> um, and so she walks past, and Kenji is stunned. You know, he goes red, and he just kind of sputters for a while. And you realize Kenji's not used to a house with little kids. That's your first clue that Kenji is, doesn't come from a, you know, a family with siblings or things like that. And it's something that is you know, revealed later as Kenji um, delivers that little monologue. Let me talk about the monologue actually for, for a moment. Um, it's one of the rare moments in the film where there's actual monologuing. Um, where Kenji says, um, after he's about to be led away, he, he goes up to Granny and says, I just want to say, thank you for basically letting me see what a normal family is like. And everyone's kind of stunned. And I appreciated how that the film was willing to foreground that theme for that scene, um, where it's carefully weaving that in. But at, at this moment, it's important to say, here's what we're saying. And um, it's also important for Kenji, for us to understand where Kenji's coming from. Because with all of these little bits revealing about Kenji, getting that thrown in front of us confirms it. Which is, again, important from a storytelling, storytelling perspective to let the audience know that, you know, no, you're not imagining things, if you will. But there, there are so many little things in this film that is communicated through visuals and that there may be a little bit, a bit of dialogue or a, you know, a few lines just to, to fully explain it. But there's not a lot of monologuing. There's not a lot of, of characters explaining what's actually going on. Um, and again, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that, um, uh, uh, you know, the card game they play at the end is not explained. They don't explain the rules of the game. You know, that's fine. You don't really need to know it to understand what's going on. So, thank you. And, uh, so yeah, so, so, as you can tell, I'm very impressed with Summer Wars. This is a, you know, a lot is done in this film. Um... You know, Citizen Kane, no, but very impressive. And certainly there is more communicated in this film than, say, The Girl Who Left Through Time. Love that film. But this is obviously a, a more intricately and carefully told story than that one. So well done, Amor Hosoda. Can't wait to see what you come up with next. So that's it for me digging deeper into Summer Wars. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you want to talk about cool anime films like this, please stop by my website at otakonovideo.net. 
or I'd love to talk with you about this on our forum. And uh, so that's it for this video. Thank you very much for tuning in. See you next time.